Hi everyone, welcome to Professor Long's Lectures in Anatomy and Physiology. I'm Professor Bob Long. The series of videos that you're watching are intended for use by students who are enrolled in my Human Anatomy and Physiology course at Delmar College. If anyone else finds these videos helpful, by all means use them to your advantage. I hope that they're helpful in understanding some of the more complex physiological processes and they help you understand some of the material. Um, but because every course is kind of designed specifically by an instructor with a specific goal in mind, my class may not go exactly into all of the detail in some areas that some instructors do. For example, right now, this specific video is intended for my Human Anatomy and Physiology 2 course, um, and we're doing a series on the sensory physiology. This is the second video on the eyeball. And uh, if we did everything in the chapter on the eyeball, we could do an entire semester on it. So I'm gonna trim some material out. I'm gonna try to focus on those concepts that I think are important for those students who are running into the uh, Allied Health Science programs at Del Mar, which is an overwhelming majority of our students. Um, so anyway, uh, as you know, we're in the coronavirus shutdown, so these videos are pretty crude. I'm doing them pretty quickly with my cell phone just to keep my students moving because I'm, a, I'm not an online guy, but I'm having to do some online teaching. So anyway, um, now last, in the last video, we started covering the eyeball, and I did a lot of external anatomy of the eye, the palpebrae, the lacrimal structure, the flow of tears through the eyeball. You should know all of those structures. You should know all that anatomy and physiology. Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to pick up on page 11 of my note set. So if you're in my class, I hope you're on page 11 in the note set. We're going to do the bottom half of the page. Now the way the eyeball is set up is it's set up with three layers of tissue. We call the layers tunics. Some people refer to them as layers or coats or tunics. The original anatomical terms that were used were the three tunics of the eye. So um, I'm going to run into these and then we'll... Um, we'll start moving into some more complex physiology. What I'm gonna do is introduce the three tunics, and then I'm gonna go through each one of them and go through all the details I can of each uh, specific layer so that you guys can follow along in the note set. So uh, let's get started. The first of the three tunics of the eye is called the fibrous tunic. Now, when you learn anatomy and physiology, and once you get into science, you should get to the point to where certain words make certain things pop into your head immediately. You should be able to picture this stuff. Now, the fibrous tunic is mostly dense connective tissue. You should start to think of collagen fibers, elastic fibers, and connective tissue anytime you see the term fibrous. Now, it's a very tough, thick layer. It's the outer layer of the eye. We're gonna talk more about its detail in just a second. The second major layer of the eye is called the vascular tunic. Now, anytime you see vascular, you should start thinking blood vessels. Um, the vascular tunic of the eye was originally named because it has a lot of blood vessels in it. It's far more complex and has more structures in it than that, a lot of muscle tissue. And we'll talk about that when we get to it. The third layer of the eye, or the third tunic, is called the neural tunic. This is the layer that has the neurons in it. It's mostly the retina, but there's another layer of the eye that plays an important role, or another la sub-layer of the neural tunic. So I'm going to go through each one of these layers in detail. So I'm going to erase these two so that we can focus on the fibrous tunic at the moment. The fibrous tunic is mostly made up of two specific structures. One of the structures of the fibrous tunic is the sclera. Now from the last video, as you know, the sclera is really known as the white part of the eye. So when you're looking at someone's eyeball, all of the white part of the eyeball around the colored part and everything else is called the sclera. And it is mostly dense connective tissue. Now, the functions of the sclera is such, okay, it's filled with a lot of collagen. And as you should have learned in part one, collagen is tough stuff. So the sclera um, provides shape and support to the eye. It, you know, even when you drain all the fluid out of the eyeball, it doesn't completely collapse down on itself like an empty bag. It still maintains, it's almost like a flat soccer ball. It's not 100% flattened. And so it does give some shape and support for the eye. And it also provides a strong point of attachment for the extraocular muscles. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a language lesson here. The term extraocular means outside the eye, okay? 
Another way to say this is the extrinsic eye muscles. And you'll hear me use these two different terms, extraocular muscles or extrinsic eye muscles or extrinsic muscles of the eye. Extrinsic means outside of, intrinsic means within or inside. So you'll hear me use that term as well. So that's pretty much what the sclera is. It's dense connective tissue layer, it provides some shape and support for the eye, and it provides a really strong point of attachment for the extraocular muscles. Now in lab, we're going over the four extraocular muscles. And you should know the superior rectus. For example, if we were looking at the eyeball from an anterior view, again, here's the, right, here's the nose, so we'll draw the right eyeball. Here's the pupil. Here's the iris. And as you know from the last video, if we were looking at the eye from a lateral view, at the front of the eye, there's a structure that bulges out, which would be called the cornea. The cornea is somewhat transparent, so all of this out here, all the way around, would be sclera. The optic nerve penetrates the sclera and enters into the eyeball, but this gives you an idea. So, when we're looking through the cornea, we can see the uh, iris, the colored part of your eye. There are six extraocular muscles that pull on the eyeball. One that's attached here and runs almost straight back at a downward angle called the superior rectus. The superior rectus, when it contracts, moves your eyeball to look in the superior direction. There's one over here that's attached that runs kind of at an angle. They all run towards the optic canal, so to speak. And this one would be called the medial rectus, since the nose is over here and this is the midline. The medial rectus, when it contracts, pulls the eye across the midline of the eyeball. Out here would be the lateral rectus. So we can say that the medial rectus adducts your eye. It brings it towards the midline. And then the lateral rectus adducts the eye. And then we have the inferior rectus. The inferior rectus pulls your eye to make it look in the inferior direction. So these four muscles, the name of the muscle actually tells you which direction it moves the eye. The medial rectus makes you look medially. The lateral rectus will make the eyeball look out, outward or laterally. Superior rectus moves your eyeballs up. Inferior rectus makes you look down at your toes if you did not move your head. Now, and later on, we're going to learn that in the center of our field of vision, as light comes in here, really what's happening with our lens and the cornea is that they're going to try to focus the light, a dot of light, right on a structure called the fovea, which is in the retina. Um, so, when we look left or right, one of the things that happens is this. And this is about the only way I know how to do this, okay? If I put a blue dot on the palm of my hand, then when I'm looking straight at the camera, light would be hitting there if I were focusing my eyes on that point. But once I start to rotate it a little bit, because of the way the eyeball is shaped, I would actually have to rotate the eye a little bit in another direction in order for that fovea to be in the center of line of vision. So when we look left and right, we also have to slightly rotate the eyeballs so that we can keep the fovea in the center of the line of view. Because of that, we also have two other muscles called obliques. There's one that comes from underneath the eye. It'll run a little bit posterior to this back here and attach this way. That's the inferior oblique. When it contracts, it rotates your eyeball so that the top goes laterally and the bottom goes uh, medially. And then there's another muscle that comes up and loops through a little piece of connective tissue over here and attaches to your eyeball like this. That one's called the superior rectus. And when the superior rectus contracts, it pulls through a little pulley or trochlea and makes your eyeball rotate in this direction if we were looking at the right eyeball. So, one thing that I think is important for people to know is that there were three of your 12 cranial nerves which were dedicated for eyeball motion. That must be really, really important for vision uh, and for survival and reproduction. So, uh, one of the things that we know is the oculomotor nerve controls almost all the eyeball muscles. So when you go over the cranial nerves, cranial number three, cranial nerve number three was called the oculomotor nerve. Oculomotor means moves the eyeball. The way that you learn this is this. So cranial nerve number four was called the trochlear nerve. 
Well, trochlea means pulley, and that's what this little loop of connective tissue is that this muscle loops through. So the trochlear nerve actually controls the superior oblique. And then cranial nerve number six is called the abducens nerve. The abducens nerve is going to abduct your eye. To abduct means to move away from midline. So cranial nerve number six controls the lateral rectus. Cranial nerve number four controls the superior oblique. And then cranial nerve number three controls the rest of the eye muscles. It's kind of an easier way to know which eye muscles are controlled by which cranial nerves. You should know that. No cranial nerve 3 controls all the muscles of the eyeball except for the one that the trochlear controls, superior oblique, and the abducens, that's the lateral rectus. All right? Now, all of those muscles are pulling on this connective tissue, and so we want it to be really, really strong. Now, I'm going to erase all of this. I hope you got that down. And I need to do the last structure or the second structure, which is part of the fibrous tunic, which is the cornea. Well, like I said before in the last video, if a photon of light hits the sclera, it's reflected off. It doesn't enter the eyeball. The cells that are going to interpret the photons of light that are going to be triggered by them and send a signal to our brain so we can see are inside the eye in the layer of the neural tunic and, and the retina. So when we are seeing something, what we need is when the light hits the cornea, it actually penetrates the cornea and enters into the front of the eyeball. So that's what we're going to say is the function of the cornea. So I'm going to erase this. The second major structure of the fibrous tunic is called the cornea. The cornea is said to be a translucent or transparent. Actually, it's somewhat opaque. To be translucent means it really lets all the light through and it does, it does refract some of the light a little bit, but we refer to it as a translucent layer or part of, sorry, it's the translucent part of the fibrous tunic that allows light, or we can say photons of light, to enter the front of the eyeball. Sorry. Okay. Those are the two major structures of the fibrous tunic. And by the way, don't forget about the conjunctiva, which covers the cornea and a little bit of the sclera. So now, I'm going to erase some of this. We're going to move into the second layer of the eye, which is called the vascular tunic. And as we do the vascular tunic, there's a lot of structures and there's a lot going on, so follow along, okay? When it comes to the second major tunic of the eye, we're going to talk about the vascular tunic. Oops. So the major structures of the vascular tunic, one of them is called the choroid coat, or the choroid layer, also called the choroid plexus. Now before I go into all of this, there's a concept that I want to repeat to all of you guys and um, get across to y'all. Now normally I have such a big board in class and I have a drawing of the eyeball off to the side and we just keep adding notes. I'm going to redraw this and we're going to see all the anatomy come together. But I want to explain the choroid plexus and the necessity for it. So the example that I like to use for my classes is this. Imagine if you decided to move off the grid to get away from the rest of the world. So probably what you're going to do is if you're going to start to build a little casa somewhere, you're going to do it somewhere near water. We have to have water in order to survive, but not only do we need water to survive, we also can make waste in the water. And if the river's flowing in this direction, then you can go get water, you can make coffee with it, you can do all the things you need to do. And if you make waste into the water, it washes it away. Also, other animals, fish, little crawdads and things, deer, other animals, need to come to use the water as well, which provides you a source of food and nutrition. Now, over time, what if someone else decides, I want to live off the grid too, and so other people start moving in, 
Oh, and by the way, you get a partner in life and all these people start moving in and moving downstream, building little houses. Well, it's no big deal because if you gotta go to the restroom, it all gets washed down to them. But what happens if people start moving upstream from you? And these people start not only utilizing all the supplies, but also start making waste in there. You go out to get a, a bucket of water to make some coffee in the morning, and your neighbor's reading the newspaper, sitting in the river, um, making waste. Well, some people would wait long enough and let it wash away and go, it's no big deal. Some people would say, oh no, I will never, ever, ever, ever drink from that river again. How gross. But one of the things we don't realize is, what if the river goes around and around and around, and so everything you take out of it and dump into it is going to circulate back to you? Well, the river represents your blood. Our blood is filled with water and ions and nutrients that we need to sustain life. We take stuff from it, and we dump stuff in it. The people represent the cells of your body. Eventually, if we continue to dump waste into the river, it becomes contaminated, or... You've heard this term, sepsis, where it goes septic. If you know what a septic tank is, that's where everything goes when you flush the toilet at a farm. Well, we don't want our blood to become septic. It would start to poison our cells, and we would all start to get sick and die. And that's what happens when we don't clean our blood. Now, fortunately, Mother Nature put several organs here. One is called the liver, and we have a couple of kidneys that clean our blood and filter it. But on occasion, some of the waste of some cells, even though it's in trace amounts, will get into an area before we can go and filter and clean it. Now, one of the things I like to remind my students is this. Our cells have a range of conditions in which they operate called homeostasis. And for some cells, those ranges are very narrow. Everything must be perfect. The cells are big wimps or weenies. If oxygen and glucose and calcium and sodium and potassium and everything's not just right, those cells start freaking out and, and dropping like flies. Some cells have very wide ranges of homeostatic conditions. They can take big fluctuations in things. I like to think of it this way. The biggest wimps in the human body are neurons. So neurons can't handle even a little bit of toxin and trash from other cells being dumped in. So, what happens if one of these two cells says, I can't handle that, and I'm going to move back to the city unless you do something? What you have to do then is you've got to actually siphon off some of the fluid, run it through a special filtration membrane, and then what you get out would have been cerebrospinal fluid. And this filtration membrane is a special series of blood vessels in the brain that we call the choroid plexus. So essentially the choroid plexus filters your blood to form cerebrospinal fluid, a really pure and clean solution that has lots of nutrients and ions and valuable stuff for the neurons. And then as they dump their waste back into it, it gets reabsorbed back into our bloodstream. Well, the retina inside the eye is neurons. I mean, it's gotta have the same kind of filtration membrane. So the choroid plexus or the choroid coat of the eye basically supplies oxygen, nutrients, and ions, and it removes waste and carbon dioxide back into the bloodstream. That's the major function of the choroid coat, which is a large part of the vascular tunic. So now that we have this concept down, I hope you understand that concept because everywhere in the body that we have neurons, we have special filtration structures, a choroid plexus, so to speak. So I'm gonna erase all this, and we're gonna continue on with the other structures of the vascular tunic. I'm gonna do some of this, and then I'm gonna stop because when these videos get too long, guys, it takes me forever to load them into YouTube, and I'm trying to beat the deadline of the first day of class. So when we go through the choroid coat, this second major structure, or through the vascular tunic, I should say, is called the ciliary body. Now, anytime you see body in A&P, that means there are several structures that function together. And the ciliary body is made up of 
three basic structures or three major structures. There's the ciliary muscle. The ciliary muscle is a muscle that controls the shape of the lens for what we call accommodation. Sorry. Or focusing. When we have to focus, the shape of the lens, our lens is rather elastic. It's made up of some elastic fibers that, um, that are called lens fibers that allow the lens to, be, to change shape. The muscle is going to pull on the ends of it or relax and allow the lens to be pulled into a flatter shape or when the muscle relaxes, actually when the muscle contracts it becomes more rounded. We'll talk about the details of that. So that's what the ciliary muscle does. Attached to the ciliary muscle is some structures called suspensory ligaments. The suspensory ligaments simply suspend the lens for accommodation. Or they just suspend the lens. We're just going to leave it at that for now. And I'll draw this and show it to you in just a second. And then we have the lens itself. The lens can change shape. To focus at different distances. And I'm going to explain all this and then we'll wrap up this part of the video. Okay? So the ciliary muscle is going to contract and relax. It's going to change the shape of the lens. What suspends the lens or attaches it to that muscle is suspensory ligaments. And then the lens itself, since it's made out of a lot of lens fibers which are very elastic in nature, um, can change shape to refract or bend light. There's one other structure that's a major player, and really two, but one of them is the lack of a structure uh, uh, in the vascular tunic. There's the iris. So one of the things we say about the iris is that it is the pigmented, pigmented part of the vascular tunic. Oops, I didn't spell that very well. It's the pigmented part of the vascular tunic. And its major function is it can regulate the amount of light entering the posterior cavity of the eye. And I'm going to explain what this is in a minute. Okay? So, the structure called the iris is the part of your eye that has pigment or color to it that gives you your eye color. And it's really a muscular structure that can regulate the amount of light that enters the posterior cavity of the eye. Within the iris is a hole called the pupil. So for the pupil, it's simply just a hole in the iris that allows light through. So for you to see what I'm talking about, I'm going to draw all this stuff out. So we're finishing up with page 11. We're going to be moving on to page 12. And I'm going to talk about all of these structures, okay? So let me erase all of this. I hope you got the notes down. And let me explain a few more things. And let's look at it visually so we can actually see what we're talking about. So as you guys know, the um, fibrous tunic will arch around to the, towards the back of the eye like this. I didn't draw a very neat version of it, but you get the idea. There's a little border between the sclera and the cornea called the corneal limbus or the limbus of the eye. And then the fibrous tunic comes around this way. Kind of a little bit inferior to the midline is where the optic nerve comes into the eyeball. Okay, so this is your fibrous tunic, sclera and cornea. We've done that. Entering into the eyeball through the optic nerve are some blood vessels, and some of those blood vessels run just deep to the sclera. This layer of blood vessels is what we're going to call the choroid coat, or the choroid plexus of the eye. It's going to deliver blood to the eyeball. Now when we get close to the front of the eye, there's two major muscular structures. One of those muscular structures is what we call the ciliary muscle. I hope that color shows up. I'm going to switch colors um, so that you can see a little bit better. I'm not sure how well orange shows up on the camera. 
I don't actually get to watch all of my videos. So there's a muscular structure that hangs down in here. And this structure is the ciliary muscle. Now, as I stated in the last video, briefly, the ciliary muscle is actually a ring-shaped muscle like this. Okay? It's got some fibers going around like this. And the ciliary muscle, if I cut it in half, well, before I finish, let me show you this. There's some little tiny hair-like structures that go all the way around the edges of the ciliary muscle called suspensory ligaments. And then they're going to attach the lens here. So as the ciliary muscle constricts and dilates, it's going to change the shape of the lens because these little suspensory ligaments are suspending the lens. So there will be some little connective tissue pieces here, and then the lens will be suspended like this. So this is our ciliary body, the ciliary muscle, the suspensory ligaments, and the lens. And when the muscle contracts and relaxes, it will allow the lens to change shape. The other muscular structure that comes off of that is going to be this structure that hangs down like this called the iris. And again, the iris is also a ring-shaped muscle or a round muscle. But there's actually two layers of muscle here. One of the layers of muscle goes around this way. We call this one the pupillary oops, constrictor muscle. When this muscle, which is actually called an annular muscle, we'll write some of this out and talk about it later, but the, it's an annular muscle. The term anu means ring, like the anus finger, the annular finger is where you, your ring finger, or the, you know, the anal sphincter. This is a sphincter type muscle. When it, con when it con uh, contracts, it actually is gonna squeeze down or make this, the size in here much smaller. The hole in the middle, would be the pupil. So if the pupillary constrictor muscle contracts, the pupil gets smaller. There's another muscle in the iris where the fibers actually run outwardly. I'm going to use a different color so you can see this. The fibers are going to run out like this. And these are the actual lines that you see because this muscle sits in front of the pupillary constrictor. And the muscle fibers that are running outward are actually going to pull in this direction. They're going to pull outwardly. And that represents what we call the pupillary dilator muscle. That is actually described as a radial muscle. When we talk about radial muscles, what we mean is the radial muscle fibers will radiate out in a ring like rays of sunshine. Annular muscles are ring-shaped muscles. So when the pupillary constrictor muscle contracts, the pupil actually gets smaller. When the pupillary dilator muscle contracts, it dilates or increases the size of the pupil. So if we took a good look at this, in this sense, when light enters the front of the eye, let's say a photon of light enters the cornea, if it hits the iris, that light cannot enter into the back of the eye where the retina is. The only light that's going to be allowed into the eyeball is that which penetrates the pupil itself and hits the lens. So some of the light gets blocked here. The only amount of light that enters the back of the eye, called the posterior cavity back here, is going to be that light that passes through the pupil. If I increase the size of the pupil, then when I dilate my pupil and it gets larger, you can see that a dilated pupil would allow all of the light that was previously blocked into the eye. So that's going to be really important because, as you know, if it's too bright, you can't see. It's almost blinding. If it's too dark, you can't see much detail. So we have to have just the right amount of light. And reflexively, these two muscles are always adjusting the size of the pupil to regulate the amount of light entering the back of the eye. Okay? So, um, one of the things I do want to mention at this point, because that's the next thing in the note set, now that we know the anatomy and we see it, let me erase all this and I'll redraw it much more pretty and neatly, okay? Um, now that we can kind of start to visualize the anatomy here, we can start to understand the words that we're writing and the words in the textbook and they'll start to make more sense. 
So I'm going to put a few details about the pupillary dilator and the pupillary constrictor muscles down. And I want you to know this information, okay? Because it's really important for your understanding of a lot of things. So now, if I'm going to draw, redraw the pupillary constrictor muscle, let's say the pupil is that big and the pupillary constrictor muscle goes around like this. We're not drawing the iris now. I'm actually going into this muscle, um, or the muscles inside the iris itself. When that muscle contracts, the size of the pupil actually gets smaller. The iris doesn't change size, but the, the muscle contracts, making the pupil smaller. So, for the pupillary dilator muscle, I'm sorry, pupillary constrictor, it can decrease the size of the pupil in two scenarios. In a, in a dark room, I'm sorry, in a bright room, getting ahead of myself, when it's too bright or under parasympathetic stimulation. Our pupillary constrictor muscle will decrease the size of the pupil if it's too bright or if you're under parasympathetic stimulation. I know my hand, my penmanship is kind of poor right there, but um, as you guys should know, parasympathetic is rest and digest. If you're trying to take a nap or go to sleep, you want less light in the eyeball that helps you fall asleep. So you should know that the pupillary constrictor can decrease the size of the pupil when you're in a bright room or under parasympathetic stimulation. Now, I'm going to erase all that. For the pupillary dilator muscle, let's say the pupil is this size. The pupillary dilator muscle, its fibers run outwardly. And when you look at the models, you'll see within the pupil all these lines running out. You're actually seeing the, the muscle fibers of the pupillary dilator muscle. When that muscle contracts, the fibers are actually going to pull out in this direction, the way that they're attached inside. And so what it's going to do is it will increase the size of the pupil as the fibers pull it outwardly. Why do we want to do that? It will increase the size of the pupil in under, two, under two conditions. In a dark room, if there's not enough photons of light hitting the retina to trigger visual transduction and you can't see, you're going to try to let more light in. Or under parasympathetic, I'm sorry, under sympathetic stimulation. When someone is excited, 